Okay, everyone, welcome to the third edition of uh, VMAX. Uh, just a, a reminder, we are going to have a, a zero tolerance for abuse here in this seminar. Uh, along the way, we're going to we'll ask you to, if you have clarifying questions, to put them into the Q&A feature. They'll be answered via text. Uh, and then substantive questions we'll have in the Q&A session at the end. Uh, we will inform you via chat before we will ask you about questions. Uh, and we will not activate your audio uh, without notifying you first. Your video will never be activated at all at this time. Uh, this is being live streamed uh, on YouTube simultaneously. Uh, and for the Q&A, we'd like you to raise your hands to make it easier for us to identify you to call on. And the way that you do that on Zoom is if you click on the participants button, uh, there will be a button for you to raise your hand. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, our moderator for today, uh, which is Ralph Ludicat from UCL. Ralph, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to VMAX. And we are very happy today uh, to have this widely discussed and featured paper by, by Sergio Correa, Stefan Luck, and Emil Werner. Um, the title is um, Pandemics Depress the Economy, Public Health Interventions Do Not, Evidence from the 1918 Flu. Um, so the floor is, is yours, Stefan. You have 60 minutes. And I will stop you if there's any clarification questions that we cannot answer in the Q&A. And then we have 30 minutes afterwards for open and more substantive questions. So Stefan, you know, please kick it off. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Uh, so thanks a lot to you and all the other organizers for setting up this uh, fantastic format. I said it to you in, in, in person, but I also want to say it in public. I think this is a really great format and greatly appreciated by, by a lot of people. Uh, so this is joint work with Sergio Correa and Emil Werner, who are also both going to be here. Um, so in case my connection drops, uh, they can they can just jump in and they will help me answering questions. Now, I want to start by saying that I'm uh, very much more nervous than I've ever been giving a seminar, giving it virtually, uh, because I actually realized this morning, morning that this actually allows my mom to watch my talks as well. So mom, if you're out there, uh, please no critical questions and uh, stay safe. So two, two disclaimers up front, uh, very quickly, um, Sergio and I, we both work at the Federal Reserve. So by no means should this, uh, what we're presenting here today be interpreted as being the official views of the Federal Reserve. These are just Sergio, mine and Emil's views. Um, and the second disclaimer is that uh, as a lot of other work on this topic of, of pandemics and economics, uh, this is very much preliminary work. So this, on the one hand, uh, you know, opens a lot of scope for you guys helping us with your questions and comments. But I also just want to say that uh, some of the results as we go along with the paper may, may change. I think the basic fundamental message of the paper will remain as it is, but, you know, some of the subtleties and magnitudes may, may adjust as we go along. So let's start, just uh, jump right in. Um, so the outbreak of COVID-19 has essentially increased the demand for the analysis of the economic effects of, of pandemics, but also the policy responses to pandemics. And it has sort of painfully revealed to us that we as economists know very little about this. Um, however, it, it seems like the profession uh, at a very high speed is rising up to the occasion and producing a set of papers that allow us to understand these kind of shocks that, that, that result from a pandemic. Now, and, and, and some of those we've seen in the seminar series are already or will be seeing in, in the near future. Um, a distinct feature of the work that most of the people can be doing right now is that it's, it's largely theoretical work. Um, and that just lies in the very much nature of the fact that pandemics don't happen that often. So we don't know too much about how they affect the economy and how the policy responses to pandemics affect the economy empirically. So that's essentially where we want to come in. We want to say, well, let's um, leverage the historical experience of the 1918 flu pandemic uh, to provide some empirical understanding, in particular, not only of the very short run effects, which we can already soon from now learn about COVID, but also the medium run effects, which will take time, uh, learn about those effects uh, from the 1918 flu. Okay, so uh, I just kind of want to emphasize the importance of, of, of the 1918 flu pandemic by reading to you uh, from two newspaper articles. Uh, the first one starts with, uh, for the, 24 hours ended at 10 o'clock yesterday morning, 1,450 new cases were reported. This is the largest number of new cases reported in a single day since the disease became epidemic in New York. Another one goes, in some parts of the country, the pandemic has caused a decrease in production of approximately 50%. There never has been in this country, so the experts say, so complete domination by an epidemic as has been the case with this one. I want to ask you, what do you think these 
these newspaper snippets from newspaper articles could have in common. Well, you might, you might, you might reading them think they were just written uh, yesterday morning, uh, but in fact, what they have in common, they were both written in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal respectively at the climax of the second wave of the 1918 flu pandemic in the United States. So what do we do in this paper? In this paper, we use variation in mortality as well as non-pharmaceutical public health interventions um, across US states and cities to understand the economic effects of the 19 flu pandemic. And particularly what we wanna understand is we wanna understand what are just the economic consequences? What is the pure economic effect of a pandemic shock on the, econ on the economy and economic activity? And second, is there a trade-off between saving lives on the one hand and saving the economy on the other? Now, here we're essentially gonna leverage that Throughout 1918, there was a series of non-pharmaceutical health interventions. I'm just going to abbreviate them with NPIs going forward through this talk. There's a bunch of NPIs implemented across U.S. cities that very much resemble uh, social distancing policies that we that we see today. So back then, uh, city officials implemented the closure of schools and churches, gathering, restricted business hour, and many other policies. Some of them I will talk about in more depth. So essentially what we do in this paper, we use spatial variation in the speed and the intensity of how these MPIs were implemented across US cities. Okay, so this kind of exploiting this kind of variation will allow us to get a sense of what are the economic costs and merits of such, such interventions. Now sort of to fix ideas, I consider this figure. Okay, so this figure on the, on the x-axis, I'm going to be plotting mortality in some city C, and this is going to be when through, all throughout the talk, when I mentioned the, the term mortality, it's always going to refer to mortality with respect to the 1918 flu pandemic. This is pneumonia or influenza related mortality. So on the x axis, we have mortality in some location C. And on the y axis, we have the output or the economic, some measure of the economic activity in this location. Okay, so I, I want us to consider a hypothetical city that does not have a pandemic. So by di by definition, the mortality is going to be zero, and it's just going to be some given level of economic activity in this location. Now, just as a thought experiment, let's think what happens if a pandemic arrives in the city. So some of the citizens start contracting a virus, uh, this increases illness and ultimately also mortality uh, of some of the, of the agents in the city. Now, this will increase mortality will be moving towards the, towards the right in this figure. Now, the maybe the more interesting question here is then what happens to economic activity? But then you think about it, it's essentially somewhat uncontroversial that economic activity will also fall with the arrival of the flu, arrival with the virus, of the virus. So it's in fact something we're gonna be showing that that is the case for the 1918 flu. And the arrival of the, of the disease it depresses economic activity essentially for two reasons. There's one, which is just the direct effect of mortality on economic activity. So those agents that die are not available to, lay, to work or to consume. So it's just mechanically going to reduce output. But at the same time, also agents that end up surviving the, 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 the virus, they may actually uh, be less, may have a lower propensity to consume or maybe less, uh, uh, have a lower propensity to work because they're trying to avoid uh, to contracting the virus in, in economic or social interest. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind that there are these two forces that, that may reduce economic output. Now, the, the question really of our paper then is, what is the effect of implementing a non-pharmaceutical intervention? Okay, what, what is the effect of a non-pharmaceutical intervention, not only on mortality, that's going to be somewhat uncontroversial. In fact, the literature has shown, uh, Mark Lipsitch, uh, Howard Markle, and others have shown that this is the case for, 19, these are famous epidemiologists, have shown this is the case for the 1918 uh, pandemic, that this reduces mortality. But the, the more interesting question is, in some sense, what happens to economic activity once I implement such a, such a non-pharmaceutical intervention? Now, it's pretty clear that the economic effects of these NPIs in a pandemic should not be obvious. And here it's important this, that I say in a pandemic. Outside of a pandemic, it's pretty clear that implementing an MP, NPI, which is essentially constraining agents to consume or to work, just introducing a friction to the economy should lead to lower economic output. And in fact, it could be that NPIs by themselves reducing economic activity could also in a pandemic by reducing social interactions, reduce output. 
However, consider the fact that an NPI also reduces the spread of the virus, which was the original problem why output was depressed, why it was falling, why mortality was increasing. Okay, so essentially it becomes an empirical question, is this direct effect of NPIs on economic activity by restricting agents to, to uh, in, their social, in their social interactions, uh, reducing economic activity, or does this indirect effect that by lowering mortality in a coordinated fashion, by, by lowering mortality actually, um, is, the, is that the stronger effect and does that actually in net lead to an increase of economic activity? So at this point, I hope I'll have convinced you that this is really an empirical question that we need to answer. Do these non-pharmaceutical interventions that are targeted to lower mortality in a pandemic decrease or increase economic activity? Now, we're going to answer this question empirically for the 1918 flu pandemic. So what I'm plotting you here now is essentially a very similar figure. Now, on the x-axis, I'm going to have mortality, again, influenza or pneumonia related, per 100,000 inhabitants in U.S. cities for the year 1918. And on the y-axis, I'm going to have a measure of economic activity. Here, our preferred measure is the growth in employment from 1914 to 1919. And this is employment in the manufacturing sector. Like you may be wondering why manufacturing and why 1914 to 1919? Well, as will become clear as I go along, this is essentially driven by a data constraint. So we don't have higher frequency data on employment and, and output available. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to show you how does mortality in these cities correlate with the change in employment around the, the occasion of this, of this flu pandemic. And as you see, the, if, I, if, I, if I correlate uh, the two, it seems that there seems, to be a, there's, there seems to be a negative correlation, meaning that those cities that experienced higher mortality also see lower growth in employment around the flu pandemic. So just pick two cities, pick for instance, Pittsburgh here. Pittsburgh had a really high mortality, had a relatively low employment growth afterwards. Pick a city such as Los Angeles or Portland had a relatively low mortality and higher employment. Okay, so that's gonna be the, first finding of the paper is that mortality or the severity, mortality as a measure for the severity of a pandemic actually impacts um, and, and real economic activity. Now, what I can then further do is I can split my, my cities here in this, in this, in this uh, figure into those cities that implemented stricter non-pharmaceutical interventions and those that implemented more lenient non-pharmaceutical interventions. I'm going to do that by coloring them green if their non-pharmaceutical intervention was stricter and red if it was more lenient. And we're going to be more specific as we go on what, what these measures actually are and how, how um, and what they mean. Now, there's going to be two additional patterns and takeaways for you now. The first one is, is you, if you look at where you would find the green dots in the this, in this scatter plot, you'd see that the, the frequency of green dots is going to be much higher towards the left, much higher towards the west, which reassuringly tells us those cities that actually implemented NPIs swiftly and strictly actually had lower mortality. That's the first and somewhat uncontroversial finding, implementing on pharmaceutical interventions will reduce mortality. But then if you consider also the correlation with the change in employment from 1914 to 1919, you see, if at all, those cities that had lower mortality that also implemented NPIs have higher economic growth. So essentially what, we're, what we want to say in this picture is those cities that had higher death rates from the flu pandemic had lower output growth, and those that had lower mortality actually had higher output growth because they implemented non-pharmaceutical interventions. Now, obviously, this is just the raw data, and there's a, lo a lot a lot more things for us to do. And essentially the whole talk will be trying to understand whether there are some obvious or less obvious confounding factors that could be driving these patterns, and whether we can really understand these, these relationships that the, the data here seems to be uh, giving us as causal. But really, I want you to keep this graph in mind. If you know, this is essentially what you want to remember after you've forgotten everything else, more mortality leads to lower economic activity and implementing NPIs leads to lower mortality and higher economic growth for the case of the 1918 flu pandemic. So essentially the, the key takeaways of our papers and uh, that, that, that you'll hopefully uh, take away at the end is that the 1918 flu pandemic depressed the economy. As you will go along, I'll try to argue to you that this was large in magnitude. So to the extent that you allow us to use cross-sectional estimates to make inference about the aggregate effect of the pandemic, we're gonna find that the pandemic 
itself led to a decline in manufacturing output by 18%. And maybe what's more important is the effect is somewhat persistent. So the pattern here is not V or U shape, but it seems to be L shape. So those cities that are in those states that are more se severely affected by the flu see a persistent decline in, in their economic activity. And then the second key finding is that the non-pharmaceutical intervention did, interventions did not depress the economy. If anything, you find that cities that implement non-pharmaceutical interventions earlier and more aggressively. So we're really going to conclude. We're going to have some discussion about how these lessons actually, what these lessons tell us about today towards the end. Okay. So let me give you a quick primer on the 1918 flu pandemic. Just a few facts that you need to know. So here on the right, I'm plotting the mortality rate per 100,000 in inhabitants for the US from 1911 to 1912. And you see this strong peak around 1918. This was essentially the, the, the mortality arising from the second wave of the flu pandemic in the US. Now the flu pandemic was a, was a much larger uh, event. It spread worldwide from January 1918 to December 1920. And it killed, it's estimated to ki have killed more than 50 million people worldwide. And that's just to give you a sense of the magnitude, that's a number larger than the casualties of, of World War I. Now in the US, it killed about more than a half a million people. This is something like 0.6% of the US population. And most of those cases actually occurred during the second wave of the flu pandemic in fall 1918, which will be, most of our analysts will be about. Now, something else I want to mention is the, the, the influenza in 1918 had a very distinct feature. It was that the death rates was particularly high for otherwise healthy prime aged men in the age from 18 to 44. Now, this is something you just want to keep in mind when you think about external validity as we go along already. Now, what I'm showing you here is a photo of an emergency hospital in Fort Riley in Kansas in 1918. Uh, and this is just to, to, to give you guys a, a visual sense of the drama that unfolded back then and which is kind of frighteningly reminiscent of some of the things that we're seeing happening right now. So here in the city that I live in New York, we're, we're transforming the Javits Center right now into emergency hospital. There's uh, hospitals being built in Central Park. Similar things happened back then. But this is just, just for, to give you an impression of that there are certain, at least at, at the surface, some, some parallels between the two uh, uh, pandemics. Now, this is an economic history project. So data in economic history is always key. So what we do is we digitize and hand collect uh, data from, from a variety of sources. Most importantly, importantly we, we, we measure the severity of the flu, not by the number of cases, uh, the number of uh, people that got ill or got um, or cured in a specific location, but we think the most reliable measure, and that's probably also true for today, is actually mortality data, the number of cases of, uh, of people that, that died from the, from the influenza or pneumonia related to the influenza uh, as a share of, of the local population. So we get those data from the CDC's mortality statistics. Now our preferred measure of economic output, uh, economic activity is going to be employment and output in the manufacturing sector. We'll, we'll get that from the same census of manufacturers, which unfortunately is not conducted at an annual level, but we only have data for the years 1909, 1940, 1919, 1921, 1923. Okay, so that may be a concern that we're not really sufficiently controlling for uh, um, um, pre-trends or more um, other to the table, such as banking data or motor vehicle registration data. And among other things, we also control for demographic or socioeconomic characteristics by just using city and state level information of the decennial census of, of 19. Okay, so I'm first gonna talk for about 10, 10 minutes about just purely the economic impact of the 1918 pandemic. Okay, and I'm kind of kind of trying to avoid a larger discussion about whether this is a causal estimate or not at this point. We'll do much more about this in the paper and I'll talk a little about it. But the end, I wanna keep this part uh, somewhat shorter and then I'll talk much more about the economic effects of, of NPIs of the non-pharmaceutical intervention. All right, so when trying to estimate the, the economic impact of the 1918 pandemic, 
we're going to exploit variation mostly at the state level. So we were able to obtain mortality data for about 30 states. Uh, um, and essentially, he, here I'm, I'm giving you a map of those 30 states, and I'm going to color those states that had a higher degree of mortality in a darker blue than, than those that had a, a lower severity of the flu. And here it's important, and something I'll get back to later, kind of arrived with returning soldiers or supposedly arrived with returning soldiers uh, from Europe to the East Coast and then traveled along the railroad lines towards the West. But the severity in the actual spread across states seems, as some other academics have, have argued, somewhat arbitrary. So in some ways, we're going to try to exploit this variation that there are some states where the flu killed many more people than in other states. Essentially, what does it, how does that transform into an econometric specification? Well, we're going to estimate a dynamic difference in difference um, model where we compare the economic evolution in some state uh, S in a given, at a given point in time T. Uh, um, and then we're going to compare states with, that are more or less severely affected by the flu measured by the mortality of the flu at the state level in, in 1980. Now, I want to say when we say we measure the severity by mortality, so mortality again stands for much more than just the people that have died, but it is essentially just the most, the least noisy, the most precise information we can get on how prevalent the flu was in, in those locations. Okay, so specifically the model that we're going to estimate is on the left-hand side is going to have some measure of economic activity in state S in some given year T. And we're going to be interested in the, in the coefficient on mortality in that state in 1918. And in fact, we're going to estimate this dynamic because we're going to have a sequence of coefficients. Co you see this little T here at the beta. We're going to estimate a coefficient for every year in our panel, except the year we're going to normalize the coefficients to the to the year right before the last year, the last point of da data point we had right before the, the flu hit. Okay, so this is going to give us a sense of the dynamic effect on 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 economic output of mortality in 1918, and essentially this allows us to to control for the pretrend in a very elegant way. Now. It's very important to say that we're going to include a whole battery of controls. This is going to be uh, these, this XS here. And we're going to control for it in, in, a, in a way that we allow for the relationship of the controls and the outcome variable to also vary across time. Okay, so again, these, the, the coefficients on the controls are also going to be time varying. Now that's very important because just recall in 1918, when the flu was very severe in the United States, it's also exactly around the time when World War I ended. So there's some obvious concerns that you could be having that you know, some kind of state level characteristics just interact with the end of World War I. For instance, World War I led to a huge agricultural boom in the United States as farmers in Europe were not able to produce or sell their products on the international market. Now, the American farmers produced in a way as if, uh, produced goods and expanded their capacities in a way as if European farmers would never come back to the market but when they did after the end of World War I, there was a huge bust in the agricultural prices. And that's an, one out of many obvious concerns. So what we're gonna do is we're not only gonna control for the size of a state measured by its population, we're also gonna control for things like the industry composition, what's the share of agriculture in output in the local, in a, in a given state? What's the share of manufacturing? How wealthy is the state in a per capita measure? How many cities are there? What's the share of the urban population? And all of these control variables we're going to be taking, obviously, as pre-1918. And then, as, as I said, we allow them to vary with, with, um, with time. And then the, the equation is also just going to have a, a state fixed, a set of state fixed effects and, and time fixed effects. OK, so let me just give you uh, the first set of results here. OK, so I'm just going to plot these coefficients beta t's. Uh, first, in the left panel, we're using the log of manufacturing employment as my left hand side variable. Okay, on the x-axis then I'll have time. As I mentioned, we have data available for 1909, 1940, 1919, and so on. So I'm going to get a coefficient for each of those years, and I'm going to get a confidence band. I'm going to, I'm going to estimate them in relation to the coefficient of 1914, so I'm not going to have a confidence band for 1914, and all these coefficients are in normalized by 1914. And then these confidence bands essentially uh, tell you whether the coefficient is uh, statistically significant uh, at the 5% at the level. Okay, so the first important takeaway is that those cities that had higher and lower mortality or were more severe, less severe exposed to the flu had about the same 
the same uh, level of manufacturing employment in 1909 in relation to 1914. But then after the flu strikes in 1918, employment in those states that have higher exposure to the flu drops, and it drops considerably, and it's statistically significant. So essentially what we're finding here is that a, a one standard deviation increase in mortality, that's an, about a hundred, an additional 150 uh, people per 100,000 dying, is going to lead to a fall of manufacturing employment of about six percentage points. So that's, it's, it's essentially uh, a, a uh, economically sizable and statistically significant effect. And here again, I wanna remind you the mortality measure itself it's just a way of measuring the exposure to the flu, how many, how, mu how, how much cases of the flu were in a given case, okay? So the mortality itself, 150, per 150 persons per 100,000 does not mechanically translate into a 6% drop in manufacturing employment, but there has to be some other things going on in the back. But just to make sure that you're not really concerned about that, you could be concerned just saying the number of people dying is just gonna reduce the number of employees um, mechanically. So we also estimate the model again, not using the log of employment, but using the ratio of employment to, pop, to population, an estimate of population in every given year. And again, the same pattern emerges. The cities that are more exposed to the flu have about the same uh, uh, ratio of manufacturing employment to population in 1909, but then there is a stark drop in 1919 after the flu. Itself. So essentially the first takeaway here should be that as the flu uh, was affecting states, those states that experienced higher mortality that were more exposed to the flu experienced a drop in manufacturing employment after the flu uh, uh, wave had been, had been there. Now, you could be, as I mentioned, concerned that these data are at a very low frequency. They're not available at an annual level. So we just do the same exercise again using, using other outcomes. So here on the, on the panel on the left, I'm going to, in the same model that I was showing you before, I'm going to use the log of total banking assets at, at the state level as my left-hand side variable. Now, why can I do that? Well, recall in, in this time around 1918, uh, the, the US banking system was heavily regulated. And in particular, there were very strong branching restrictions of the banks. So banks could not have a national branching network, but banking was very local. So then to the extent that you believe that financial conditions and real conditions are correlated, then this is just yet another measure of real economic activity or potentially another measure of real economic activity. And with banking assets, as with manufacturing employment, a similar pattern arises. The number, the, the amount of banking assets in locations that are more or less affected by the flu is about the same prior, prior to the flu, but then after the flu is hit across time, uh, it converges to a, a lower level. On top of that, in the, in, the, in, the, in the right panel, we do the same exercise, now not using banking assets, but using the number, the, the, log, the log of the number of motor vehicle registrations in a state. Now, recall that the, the car at this time is still a luxurious good. The car is not as prevalent as it is today, but a lot of the research that has been done on, on, on pandemic shocks already is essentially telling us, or often we use this language of saying a pandemic is a supply and demand shock at the same time. So we try to kind of, try to, we, we wanted to kind of understand that a little better. So we thought maybe motor vehicle registrations can be kind of used as a proxy for durable consumption. Um, and so we have that at the state level, and then we see the effect is maybe not as clear cut as with a manufacturing employment or bank assets, but we see that again, after the flu has arrived, those states that were more exposed to the flu uh, experience a starker drop in, in motor vehicle registrations. So to the extent that you allow us to, to argue that manufacturing is more, uh, is a tradable, tradable good, and thus more a shock to manufacturing is more a supply side shock, and then, Automobile consumption is more a local is a is a local consumption good. This tells us a little bit about both supply and demand data, but we don't want to push that too far. Um, essentially, what I just want you to take away here is that there seems to be relatively convincing evidence that mortality in the flu in 1918 has uh, significant effects on real economic activity in those states. Uh, um, compare those comparing those states that are more uh, severely affected than others. Now, we do a lot more things in the paper. Um, one thing, one obvious thing that you could be 
concerned about is that the economic outcomes in the mortality in 1918, they could be jointly determined or could be endogenous. Uh, and I think that's a fair concern. So everything that I've shown you so far, you should really rather interpret as a, as a correlation than as a causal relationship. But in the paper, we do a little more. Um, essentially, we show that our results are robust to using the mortality in 1917 as opposed to 1918 as an instrument. Um, and so, so the idea here is essentially that some regions are just inherently more exposed to the flu than others. Uh, but in normal times, that really does not affect real economic activity. In a normal, in a given year, this does not affect real economic activity. But once in a while, if a, there's a huge pandemic, that it actually translates into the effect of the, uh, on real economic activity. So this is very much in the spirit of the instrument that, that Chris Palmer uses in his job market paper on, on the exposure of, of, of uh, areas in the US to the, to the housing crisis. Okay, so we, we try to add a little bit more of a causal interpretation to our estimates there. And we then also show that our results are robust to using other types of outcomes. And we do a whole battery of robustness checks that essentially try to give us a sense of, um, um, essentially tell us that this effect is, 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 is uh, surprisingly robust, or the statistical relationship is surprisingly robust. So altogether, I want you to take away that the, the pandemic has a persistent negative effect on the economy, and our preferred interpretation of this effect is, is, is a causal one. All right, so let me get now to, to the second part of the talk, which is sort of at the core of the paper, which is now we want to understand the, the economic impact of, of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. Okay, so again, I just want to show you a photo. Uh, this is now a photo of US soldiers uh, in France uh, watching a movie in a theater uh, waiting to return to the United States. And if you, if you watch, if you look at this photo for a minute, you, 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 you realize there's a, there's a systematic pattern. All of these gentlemen are wearing face masks. Um, so um, on top of that, I want to tell you the story that it, during the 1918 flu pandemic, the New York Health Board actually uh, try to encourage citizens of New York City to wear face masks, and it, it did so under the motto, better ridiculous than death. So this is just to give you a sense that at the time, there was actually plenty of non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, that were implemented. And what we're going to exploit in this paper is that there's no coordinated federal response to the pandemic. Uh, the implementation of these non-pharmaceutical interventions was, by and large, at the discretion of local city officials. And I've, I've alluded to this before, but there are several examples of, of these MPIs that were implemented. Um, the school, theater, and church closures. There were bans on public gatherings, such as the Liberty Loan Parades, but also funerals. There was a systematic uh, case isolation. And there was, as I just shown you in the photo, there was mandatory uh, face masks. Uh, it was mandatory to wear a face mask. Now here we really build on the work that epidemiologists have done already. So we're going to we're going to take a measure of how on the speed and another measure on the intensity of these non-pharmaceutical interventions for 43 U major U.S. cities from a paper from Howard Markle uh, and his co-authors published in 2007 in, 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 in the JMA. Okay, essentially we take two measures from that paper to measure the to get a sense of how uh, NPIs were implemented across cities. The first one is just the speed of NPIs. Okay, what's the speed of NPIs? Well, it's going to be the number of days between a non-pharmaceutical, the first non-pharmaceutical intervention is activated in a city, and when the weekly excess death rate exceeded twice its baseline death rate. Okay, so essentially you're looking at a city, you're calculating what is the moving av average of a death rate flu-related in that city, and once it's exceeded its, what they use in their paper is the 24-week average uh, um, of the baseline death rate, um, you, you will you define that as the more the mortality acceleration date. Okay, so we're going to just take this measure the speed by taking the number of days that have um, passed since, or uh, well, we're taking the, the difference just between the number of days and when the this rate has when the mortality has accelerated. Okay, so if this is, this is a um, on average, it, it it took the the cities around seven and a half days to to intervene. Um, so. The second measure that we have is we're going to measure the intensity, not only the speed, but also the intensity of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. So this is going to be counting the number of days in a city in which one, two, or three key non-pharmaceutical interventions were, were activated. 
Okay, so what these guys do is essentially they look, they go through newspaper articles for, for all of these 43 cities and they define three major categories of NPIs. And then they just count the number of days on which those kind of NPIs were in place. And here the average is 88 days. And this is not to under, misunderstand, misunderstand this. This is not that the average city had 88 days of NPIs in place, but this could be essentially one city having 30 uh, uh, days of NPIs in place, but around three of them in, in each given day. Okay. So just to replicate the basic finding of the epidemiology literature, I'm plotting you here um, either the speed of NPIs, how quickly they were implemented, and then the excess mortality rate in, in 1918, or the intensity of these NPIs, as I just explained, by counting the number of days by which these NPIs are in place. Okay, so a city that has essentially a positive number uh, for the speed of NPIs is a city that implemented uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions before actually uh, the, the, the mortality rate accelerated, a negative number is implement, uh, imply that you uh, implemented the measures after the, the mortality rate is accelerated. So let's just pick two cities here. If you, for instance, look here at Seattle, Seattle took about something like six or seven days to implement an MPI, and it had a relatively low mortality rate. If you look at New Haven, New Haven took more than 22 days to implement an MPI and had a relatively high mortality rate. So all in all, you get this negative correlation between excess mortality and the speed of non-pharmaceutical and you can do the same thing here of the intensity of NPIs. Again, you can find Seattle down here and you can find New Haven up here. You see in New Seattle in total has something like 160 days of NPIs in place, New Haven only 40 days. So it's important to keep in mind these two measures in some ways are gonna be highly correlated. Um, now this is really just the basic finding of, of the epidemiology literature that tells us that uh, in the 1918 flu pandemic, NPIs, social distancing, uh, reduced both, not only peak mortality, it not only flattened the curve, but it also just reduced the total number of people that, that actually died from, from the virus. Now, what's our empirical approach here? Our empirical approach here is we're going to estimate a model that's very similar to the one you've just seen above, um, but this one is just going to be at the city level. We're not going to look at state level outcomes, we're going to look at city level outcomes. So we're going to be interested in some economic outcome measure at the city level, city year level. And then we're, we really want to know what is the coefficient or what are the, what's the sequence of coefficients on some measure of non-pharmaceutical interventions in this location. And it, as I said, we're going to use, we're going to essentially have two iterations for this model. We're going to do this with the speed as well as with the intensity of NPIs. Now, it's quite fortunate for me that many of your microphones are muted right now because probably a lot of you are just screaming, well, this is endogenous. These NPIs and these, and these economic outcomes, they may be jointly determined. So this is really the key concern to our analysis. It's that you know, there could be some unobserved heterogeneity. It could be that cities that are more likely to impl implement these NPIs are also cities that have, for instance, a better local healthcare system and better local governance. And those things in turn may actually be also contributing to, to ec economic growth. So there could be some kind of reverse causality going on. It could even be much more simple. It could be that the incentive to implement an NPI is going to be much higher in a location uh, that has better economic prospects, okay? So that's really important to keep in mind that there's this key concern underlying this, this estimation. So if we wanna get a causal interpretation of these estimates, we need to do much more. So what we ask ourselves when we start this project is what was really the source of variations in these non-pharmaceutical interventions? And when we studied this, the, the first thing that came to mind is actually, well, the cities in the West actually learn from the cities in the East. Okay, what I'm gonna be plotting you here now is a interactive map of the United States. And I'm gonna assign a red dot to cities in which the flu has arrived. And then I'm gonna assign a green dot to a city once it has implemented a non-pharmaceutical intervention. And I'm gonna scale the size of the dot in that case by the intensity uh, that the city ends up having in its NPI. So you see the second wave of the 1918 flu pandemic in the United States started in Philadelphia in, 19, in the end of August in late summer, 1918. So let me fast forward about a month. And on the 24th of September, 1918, you see that the flu has spread throughout most of the countries and it traveled from the East to the West. 
And we know this from narratives, it, spread, it, 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 it traveled along the railroad line. So about a month later, after the first case has been detected in Philadelphia, essentially the flu has arrived in all major cities, but only New York City has implemented non-pharmaceutical health intervention. If we fast forward another two weeks, we see that almost all of the cities, and yet another week, essentially all of the cities have implemented non-pharmaceutical intervention. And if you look very careful, those cities, the green dots in the east are going to be much smaller than the green dots in the west. So we know from, from, from reading the newspapers at the time, the cities in the west, and we see this in this map, the cities in the west observing the devastating effects of the flu in the east were able to learn and were much quicker and swiftly in implementing these non-pharmaceutical interventions. So one of the major sources of variation of these NPIs is just coming from an east-west divide. Oh, that's not all to this. This is not everything. This is not the only source of variation. In fact, if we, we dig a little bit deeper and we found some very interesting examples. So if you compare, for instance, Minneapolis and St. Paul, so-called twin cities, uh, uh, left and right of the Mississippi River. Um, so you see there are other sources of variation. For instance, the officials, the city officials in Minneapolis move very quickly. Uh, they close schools, churches, and theaters, and pool halls already in early October. Uh, in St. Paul on the opposite, everything, all the businesses, all the public institutions remain largely open until November, late November. And the, the local leaders were pretty confident, at least according to the newspapers, that the epidemic was very much under control. Only in late November then, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, which is a, a local newspaper uh, uh, titled, In Heaven's Name, Do Something as, the, as the, the pandemic was much more severe in St. Paul than it was in Minneapolis. So this is just one case study. In both cities, it's actually uh, true that they were relatively less severely affected than uh, many other cities in, in the country. So they essentially escaped the, 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 the steep death tolls. But what we also know is that the mortality in Minneapolis was lower than in St. Paul. And the economy emerged stronger too, okay? So there's several other examples like this where we can construct. So what I'm trying to tell you here is the variation to some extent is about comparing the East to the West, but there's also much more local variation that, that we can explore. Um, so having that in mind, I wanna just give you some uh, descriptive statistics of how these cities that were quick in intervening and slow in intervening compare in some, some main, main, uh, main um, descriptive statistics. Okay, so what I'm plotting you here is I'm, I'm going to split my sample of 43 cities and those that had a below median speed in intervening and those that had an above median speed in intervening. Okay, and this is essentially means the average city that intervened, oops, the, the average city that intervened quickly um, essentially took only one and a half, half days to intervene after the, the, the mortality rate accelerated. The, the, the slow cities on average took about 13 days to intervene. And as indicated before, this is very much correlated with the intensity of intervention. So those cities that intervene early end up intervening for 120 days, and those that intervene late intervene for around 57 days. And again, this is not counting the actual days, but this is the cumulative numbers of, of days on which NPIs are interpreted. As you've seen in the map that I've showed you, those cities that intervene uh, very quickly, they are further in the, in the West. So the longitude is smaller. But then if you look at some other statistics, and this in terms of the size, in terms of the degree of manufacturing employment and per capita income at the state level, these cities are actually very much comparable. Now, there is some difference, which naturally comes from the East-West divide, is that the, the state level share of employees in the, in, in the agricultural business is going to be higher in the West than it is in the East. And manufacturing is going to be more important in the East than it is in the West. So this is things we need to keep in mind. And in fact, we do keep them in mind and we again include them as control variables that are becoming even more important in this specification. So we're gonna to have to have a lot of control variables that allow us to capture this, this very salient east-west differences. They may, as I indicated earlier, interact with other things that happen around this time, such as the, the end of World War I or local industry structure. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a, a set of controls in our regressions, again, on in, in, industry structure, income, uh, public spending at the city level, past mortality, but also city density, as you may be concerned that cities in the East are just more dense than cities in the West. Okay, so here are the, essentially the, the results just in the raw data. So here I'm giving you three panels 
uh, on the x-axis, sorry, on the x-axis, I'm giving you the speed of non-pharmaceutical interventions in 1918 across all panels. And then I'm choosing different variables for the, for the y-axis. The, in the first panel, it's the growth of manufacturing employment. The second, it's the growth of manufacturing output. And in the third, it's the growth of national banking assets. Okay, and the, the pattern that arises from just looking at the raw data and it's somewhat in line with the main figure you saw at the very beginning is that those cities that intervene more quickly tend to have higher, higher economic activity after the flu has blown over. Okay, we can do this, as I said, by estimating our main model, we can do this in a more formal way, but also controlling for all these other observable characteristics. So here again, I'm plotting the sequence of coefficients now on the speed of non-pharmaceutical interventions using either, either the log of manufacturing employment, the log of manufacturing output, or the log of banking assets as my left-hand side there. Okay. Again, reassuringly for our purposes, there seem to be very to no different, very little to no differences in across these cities that have different degrees of intervention uh, in the crisis. Seems to be very little differences before the crisis in the level of employment output or, or banking assets. But once the crisis hits, you see that manufacturing employment, if at all, is higher. The coefficients here by year by year are not statistically significant, but if at all, they're going to be higher after um, after the flu. Uh, uh, hit, the output is going to be higher and national banking assets increase. Okay, and I can do the exact same exercise now, not using the speed, but using the intensity measure of non pharmaceutical interventions. And here the pattern is even clearer. Those cities that have more intense non pharmaceutical interventions that experience higher growth in manufacturing employment, they experience higher growth in manufacturing value, and if at all, they ex experience higher growth in. In, in, in national banking assets around the, the, the incidence of the 1918 flu pandemic. And the same pattern can just be confirmed again by plotting you the coefficients of estimating my regression model, uh, where I also control for all these other observable characteristics. You see that after the flu hits, those cities that intervene not only quicker, but also more intensely have multiple measures in place and keep them in place for longer, have higher output growth, sorry, have higher employment growth, higher output growth, and higher growth in banking. Okay, just in terms of the magnitude here, if you have a one standard deviation increase in your intensity of NPIs, then you're going to see a 6% higher employment growth following the pandemic. And this is, uh, it's a fairly, it's not, it's not only in our regressions uh, statistically significant, but again, this is an economically significant effect. Now, again, I want to refer you to the paper. We do a lot of other things in the paper. Um, uh, and we'll be doing a lot more things in the next version that will go online. Uh, we can control for longitude, we can have region time effect, fixed effects, we can exclude some uh, casual out, like, uh, outliers you can casually spot on the, on the scatter plots, which are in California, Oregon, or Washington. We can have port city fixed effects, we can do a lot of things. Um, what, what really is a striking pattern that the data gives us is that the robustness shows, checks show us that the effect never becomes negative. It, what can happen is if you throw in a lot of controls that the, the effect eventually becomes statistically insignificant, but the coefficient will always be positive. Now, really what, what, what's really most important for the message of our paper is that even if there's no positive effect of, of these NPIs, um, the absence of a negative effect already implies that there's no trade-off between mortality and economic activity. So, if you don't believe the results that I've just shown you because you're thinking I'm you know, lacking some important control variable, I am pretty convinced that almost any control variable, the data is such, so strong in its message that almost any control variable I use, I may not be able to show you that NPIs actually affect economic growth positively in the medium term, but at the very least, they will not lead to a reduction in economic growth. Okay, and that's really, that's really key to keep in mind. Now, the, the question then that arises though is why why could it be that these non-pharmaceutical interventions are not economically costly? And, and that question really arises because we know intuitively the direct effect of a non-pharmaceutical intervention is to restrict social interactions that are at the heart of a lot of the economic uh, interactions that we do. It essentially, it just means you're, pre pre you're, you're preventing a household from, from consuming and working. Um, so there should be some negative effect. However, as I said in my introduction, we argue that the pandemic itself disrupts the economy. So 
even in absence of a non-pharmaceutical interventions, it may be the case that households do not want to consume or they may not want to work because they want to avoid the risk of contracting the virus. And as a consequence, this may lead to businesses cutting back investments in the, in the face of the labor shortages and the higher uncertainty. So there is this indirect effect of, of the non-pharmaceutical interventions by reducing on economic activity by reducing mortality. So we argue that the non-pharmaceutical interventions, they really target the root of the problem, which is the mortality, which is the pandemic, which is the problem to begin with. So if you're coordinating your, your policy response to that, that original problem, you may actually be able to mitigate some of the adverse economic consequences. So let's just conceptualize this. Um, let's just define uh, YC as the output in some location again, mortality C as the mortality that stems from the pandemic, and NPIC as the intensity of, of some non-pharmaceutical intervention uh, under, that, that's being activated in this location C. Now, assume, just follow me for a moment here and assume that there's a reduced form relationship between output, mortality, and non-pharmaceutical interventions. Okay? This is an, essentially a reduced form relationship that will tell you that as mortality increases, output will go down because people will stop consuming and working. And as you increase NPIs, it will also reduce output because you're preventing people from, from doing economic transactions. So really the, the object of interest of our study is the derivative of this output with respect to NPIs. And there, there, as, I, as I alluded in the, slide, in the prior slide, there's essentially a direct effect of the NPIs, which is this term, which is just essentially the direct effect of preve preventing people from interacting. But then there is this indirect effect, which comes from the fact that NPIs themselves are actually means to reduce mortality. And mortality itself is what's also reducing economic activity. Now, the empirical question of this paper here is really, is this, in a, in a, in a purely uh, qualitative sense, is this effect positive or negative? But I can actually do more. I have four, four terms in this equation, and three of them I can actually empirically observe. I know, I've just shown you on the slides before, what is the effect of non-pharmaceutical interventions on output. I know from my state level results, but I can replicate them also at the city level, what is the effect of mortality on output. And I know from the epidemiology literature, what is the effect of the non-pharmaceutical interventions on mortality. So what I can do then, I can do a back of the envelope calculation that tells me what is the direct cost of the non-pharmaceutical intervention on output. So when I do that, and this is, I, I just want you to uh, consume this slide um, again with the disclaimer, this is very preliminary work. So some of the estimations we've done last week will tell us that, well, if you're increasing uh, the intensity of NPIs by one unit, you're going to in some increase the growth of output by 0.2%. Now, if you're increasing uh, mortality by, by one unit, you're going to decrease output by 0.21%. From the epidemiology literature, I know that if I'm increasing the intensity of NPIs by one unit, I'm going to save around one and a half lives. Okay, now in some, this will tell me that the, there, there is a direct effect on, on output, which I've, I've sh shown you before, but then there's this indirect effect and I can back it out by just combining these coefficients. And it will tell me that the net effect on output of NPIs is actually negative, and we estimate it to be pretty high. We estimate it to be 10 additional cumulative days of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions will actually reduce growth uh, in manufacturing employment here in our setup by around 1.4 percentage points. But because there is this indirect effect of reducing mortality and mortality being, being detrimental for economic activity, it's nonetheless a positive net effect, in which here in our case is 10 cumulative days of, of non-pharmaceutical interventions on net increased economic growth by around 1.8 1 percentage points. Okay, now if you allow this very little reduced form uh, model, which is, is, is obviously very primitive, uh, if, you, if you just allow me to use that uh, for one more slide, I can actually use it to think a little bit about um, what these, what our findings imply for today. So what is the external validity of, 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 of what we've done here? So the first thing we can think about is what are the costs of non-pharmaceutical interventions on output today? They may potentially be time varying. This may not be a parameter that we can estimate for the 1918 flu pandemic and then use for, for today's economy. 
Why is that the case? Well, on the one hand, this may be just very much higher because we're living in a more complex economy with supply chains and it's a more service oriented um, uh, economy. But on the other hand, you could be thinking it could actually be lower today because the technology that we have and this seminar is to some, ex to some extent uh, a proof of that technology allows us just to, to at least in certain industry to work, to work remotely. So it's a bit unclear to me if, I, if you allow me to speculate whether this term is going to be higher or lower today. If you think about the responsive output to mortality, this is going to be very much disease specific. So I've, I've said before that COVID-19 uh, is different than, than the 1918 flu and that it's less lethal for prime age, uh, 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 otherwise healthy men. So you may be thinking this, this term is actually much lower, uh, which then would have important implications on what degree of NPIs you wanna implement. Then again, you could be saying the technology today makes actually this crisis much more salient. Um, the overburdening of the healthcare system may affect uh, young people's behavior, otherwise healthy uh, people's behavior, even as we speak. So you could even be thinking that this to some extent may be, may be larger today as people take more preemptive action. And also this, this, this third term, how mortality res responds to non-pharmaceutical interventions is also very much disease specific. It, the more interconnected world today in principle would allow us to actually coordinate and, and, and reduce mortality much quicker than it was than, than people were able to do it in 1918. Um, but then again, you may be thinking that political partisanship today um, and disagreement uh, uh, may actually uh, make this coefficient to be somewhat larger. So I, I just wanna give you a sense that you can use this framework a little bit to speculate of how our lessons from the 1918 flu pandemic apply today. I think Emil, Sergio, and I, we take a very cautious stance here and we say, uh, this is economic history. Uh, it will not tell, give us exact guidance of what we should be doing today. What it tells us is that the 1918 flu pandemic led to massive human and economic costs. And it tells us that the non-pharmaceutical interventions, they target the root of the crisis, they, they, which is the increase in mortality, and they have economic merits in the case of the 1918 flu pandemic as well. Now, there's this quote that's, uh, supposedly um, uh, goes back to Mark Twain that history never repeats itself, but it runs. Now, what's really the lesson that you wanna take away from our paper? Um, I think the lesson you wanna take away is that the 1918 flu pandemic just shows that it's not a given. You cannot take it as a given that there is a trade-off between saving lives and saving the economy. The economy. It may be different today, but for sure we should allow for this uh, uh, possibility uh, when we think about the policy. All right, so I think I'll leave it here and I'll, I'll um, uh, look forward to the questions and the discussion. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. <clears throat> it was a really, really great talk, really informative. Uh, we already um, discussed a lot of clarification questions on the way. Uh, so if you have more questions, please uh, just raise your hands. So, you know, in the control at the very bottom of the screen, you can raise your hand and, and then I will call people who raise their hands to ask questions. Um, so to give you some time to do that, uh, I just wanted to quickly tell everyone that the VMAX team uh, got larger. We have you know, two more people on the organizing team, uh, Stefania Albanese, who is uh, part of the panelists, and uh, Laura Pilosov, who is also here. So they are also um, now organizing the VMAX series and um, enjoy this talk today. Um, perhaps, Stefan, one quick question on, on the data selection so people have more time to, to sign up. Um, so the city data that you have, um, First of all, how how, is these, how are these cities selected, and then do they differ very much, you know, from the from the overall population the sample? So I think it's, that's a great question. So the the way they were essentially, I mean, these are essentially the major cities in the United States at the time, um, and that's because so what the what Howard Markle and his team did in their paper in 2007 is they essentially went through newspaper articles to collect the information on what the official policies in those in those cities were, and um, this is in 2007, so the digital archives of local regional newspapers um, are not as easily available as they are today. So, um, so they focus on the on the major large cities, and then that naturally leads to um, some issues on external validity. So, this is not representative for, let's say, a local uh, small village. Um, so, this is city specific. Yeah. Okay, great. Let's, let's go on the, the first um, member from the audience. Uh, let's call uh, Andra Gent. Andra, can you hear us? I think so. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for all the great work. Really interesting. Um, I just want to echo 
if you could, I've sort of looked through the paper to try to understand exactly what these NPIs were. And I guess my understanding was that there was much less severe NPIs during the Spanish influenza, at least in the US. For example, Woodrow Wilson never even mentioned the Spanish influenza. And so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about what how we should think about the inter the differences in the interventions. Case isolation seems extremely different to me than having an entire state stay at home. I mean, I would think that manufacturing output right now in non-essential industries is zero. So if you could just talk a little bit about how we should compare today's NPIs to those in uh, 1918. I can, I can jump in here. I'm Neil Werner here. Yeah, we, we agree a lot with kind of the spirit of that question. So it's true. If you look at the 1918 measures, they're less severe. So the, the main measures are school closures, church closures, public gathering bans. So bans on, for example, Liberty Loan parades uh, and you know uh, quarantine and isolation of suspected cases as well as hygiene recommendations or requirements. Um, so those are less stringent than what, what we're seeing uh, today. So that, that's an important point. And I think there's a, a, a kind of a more general point about, you know, our paper doesn't have much to say about the optimal sort of exact calibration of these NPIs. I think the, the point to take away uh, more is uh, from this is that, you know, these NPIs that we saw in the past, they seem to work in terms of, of reducing mortality. Um, and, 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 and they don't seem to have much of an economic cost, at least in the year coming out of the pandemic. In terms of also the public discussion around the 1918 flu, what's really important to remember is that it happens toward the end of World War I. And so lots of you know, countries that are involved in the war, their officials are not talking about it. Um, and you know, in fact, that's why it's called the Spanish flu, uh, you know, quite unfairly is because uh, Spanish newspapers were reporting on it because they, they weren't in, involved in the war. Other countries were really trying to keep a lid on how many uh, and, you know, uh, people, including soldiers, were dying from the war. And so that's why Wilson never mentioned it. And I think actually, uh, you know, uh, ironically, I think Robert Barrow, uh, Ursula and Wang in their paper actually even mentioned that Wilson may have contracted uh, the flu himself. Um, so while he didn't mention it, he, he, he wasn't immune uh, from it. Um, but you're right. Uh, on the point about the, the intensity, it's different from today and it's, it's less intense than today. Okay, great. Um, so let's let's move on to the, to the next question. I'd say uh, so. There's a regular uh, Fabrizio Perry has a question. Here you go. Hi. Um, thank you. Great, great, great seminar. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, this my question is related to the one before. And um, the nature of your data is very long run. It's very much long run. And so uh, I think in the short run, I would think this these MPIs might have very negative effect. Yeah. Yes. Um, Do you want to answer it, Emil? Or? Uh, yeah, I can, I can just come, come with a few thoughts. So yeah, we completely agree that there's some really interesting timing in, the, in, the, in terms of the very short-term dynamics that we don't capture. We have annual data. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to digitize quarterly uh, bank data and also weekly data from Bradstreet's on sort of qualitative measures of how well a city is doing in different industries. Um, so we're hoping that maybe we can sort of try to see some of these higher frequency dynamics, because we agree with you that if you act more quickly in terms of these MPIs, you are naturally going to be reducing economic activity in the very short term. The one point that's important to mention here, though, is because you know we've seen with these exponential curves, the flu can accelerate so quickly, this short term can actually be very short term. You know, If you act two weeks earlier, um, then you're going to be depressing the economy for two weeks relative to the counterfactual of not doing anything. Um, but then after two weeks, if you hadn't done something, the economy would have, you know, would have potentially suffered a lot kind of through the arguments that, that, that we and, and others have made. So there's a question about really how, how high frequency data you would really need um, to, to sort of get at these nuanced uh, dynamics in the timing of the costs and benefits. Right, thanks. Um, so there, there's a question on, on uh, YouTube as well. Kurt, do you have the question? Yes, yeah, so this question is from Holt Dwyer. Uh, he wanted to know, he said, the United States wasn't actively involved in World War I until about 1917 or so. Uh, and so is it possible that the employment growth from 1914 to 1919 
uh, is potentially driven by war-related production rather than by the disease. <clears throat> so kind of what the, the correlation between the involvement in the war is and right. uh, employment outcomes. That, that's that's a great question, yeah. And we're, we're also, uh, we were also very concerned about that. Um, and that's partly why we like having these higher frequency banking data and also why we're trying to digitize even more higher frequency data, although of course that takes, uh, that takes time. One thing to mention about World War I though, is that in terms of the cities that benefited the most from World War I, it's not clear that it's the cities that were uh, you know, more versus less severely affected and the cities that implemented more MPI. So in particular, in World War I, it was largely cities in the East that benefited um, through you know, their, their direct trade with Britain. Of course, the, the Panama Canal was open, but still it was you know, because of kind of the proximity to Europe, cities in the East benefited more. It was really in World War II that cities in the West kind of really surged um, uh, uh, due, to, due to war production. But nevertheless, we, we are concerned about this. And you know, in the thread, we, we, we answered kind of some questions related to World War I, both mortality, but also production. We tried to control uh, for this uh, through a variety of factors and we're trying to do more. Um, but yes, that's, that's definitely an important concern to have in mind with these long run uh, differences that you know, the census of manufacture data require us to, to have to use. Great, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Um, Marco Danligo raised the hand. Marco, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, uh, great paper, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so my question, and maybe I had just haven't understood, is you know how do you address the endogeneity problem that uh, cities uh, where the MPIs hurt less economies may have done more of it? Um, if you could just we could repeat that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, maybe if I can answer to that, I think so. The 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 way we uh, think of it is that um, the variation in NPIs is is essentially to some extent largely driven by the fact that the cities in the West just had this two or three weeks advantage over the cities in the East as the flu just arrived later and then could, on, could learn from seeing how devastating it was in the East. Uh, but on top of that, there's just a lot of, so it seems, so the way you have to think of it, in 1918, the federal government did essentially nothing uh, to fight the flu pandemic. This was all at the discretion of the local city officials. Um, and really the margin that, that decided whether a city, whether an NPI was effective or not, was not, not a matter of weeks or months, but it was really something of, of days. So we believe there were, I mean, we're fairly confident that the fact that some city officials intervened a few days earlier than other city officials uh, is, is, is not going to be driven by anything that, that's related to the economic prospects. Um, but that being said, I think it's a fair concern. And so it's, it's not a quasi random assignment of NPIs. Um, yeah, well, Emil said- to, to, uh, to give one, one other, kind of uh, example. So, you know, longitude helps predict M MPIs quite strongly. And there was some discussion in the chat about whether that's a legitimate instrument or not. And we can, we can think about that. Um, but even within longitude, there's some interesting differences. For example, uh, cities, you know, this is around the time of discussion about prohibition and cities that, you know, were, were more concerned with shutting down bars. Um, uh, or some cities were more concerned with shutting down bars because they were against prohibition because they feared that if they shut them down, then they would never reopen again. So there's a lot of examples of local political economy factors um, that, that, that we've looked into and maybe we can do something more to sort of exploit that type of, of, of variation uh, as, as well. Um, you know, that, I mean, that would be great. Also in the sense that, you know, unfortunately for you guys, CDs in the East, if I understand correctly, they are more manufacturing prone and so MPI will hurt more in those CDs. So it, that doesn't quite work in, in, in your favor, but anyway. So, so we look great, at, great Ste paper. Stefan, you can pull up the, the table. We, we have a comparison of exactly, you know, the manufacturing versus agriculture versus, you know, uh, intensity. Uh, in, of cities in the east versus the west, and you know there are some some differences. Um, so the the cities that are slow do have uh, you know somewhat higher uh, manufacturing employment share. So you see it in this table in the in the second to last row. Um, but you know we can try to control for for these things, and and the differences are are not 
you know that large, although you know they are they are meaningful. But yeah, we can we we sort of try to address some of these differences in the the structure of the local economies. Um, okay, great. Um, so just to remind it to everyone, so there, there's still some open questions in the Q&A. If you want to have them answered, you know, just answer, uh, ask them live, because now we, we are in the live session uh, of the talk. And then um, Stefania and Morten, they also had questions. Uh, who wants to go first? Stefania, perhaps? Yes, uh, I'll go first. Uh, well, thanks uh, so much for a great presentation, really great work. I had a question about the use of mortality as the only outcome um, in terms of health uh, from the flu pandemic. So what do we know about morbidity and the effect that that might have had on um, economic activity? That's more of a short run effect than a long run effect or medium run effect that you're trying to measure. But I just wanted to get a sense of what um, you know the, the health history papers have to say about the effect of morbidity. And then the other thing, how do we control for the uh, variation across cities of uh, existing health uh, infrastructure? So number of doctors per capita and so on. And sort of related to Marco's point, you know, that would have affected more, uh, mortality from the flu pandemic, but it may also have affected worker productivity, you know, prior to that. And are the two effects being confounded when we go and, and look at the effects of, um, uh, you know, the MPIs via the effect on um, the flu uh, then, and then on economic activity? So what do we know about that? I think Great. that's a... That that's a fantastic question. Um, and in fact, it's something I should have maybe said in the talk. We're currently in the, in the process of digitizing data on the number of hospitals uh, and other benevolent institutions uh, in the states and the cities. And uh, th that's to your second question. So uh, it's something we want to control for, most certainly. Um, and um, we will be doing uh, in, in the next version of the paper. To your, to your first question, we're also, um, so we don't have a measure of morbidity, but we have a better sense of mortality uh, by getting the mortality data, not just in aggregate at the state or city level, but getting it by age groups, um, as well as by higher frequencies. So it's gonna give us uh, going forward somewhat of a, of a better, like maybe a more precise measure of the severity uh, of the flu. But Emil, you have something? Yeah, no, I, I just, just to second that and just to, to follow up, on the, the mortality point, we completely agree. Um, the use of mortality is more because actually like today, the mortality data uh, is more and more accurate representation of how severe the flu was in different places. The case estimates are not as good, um, but the health literature uh, as far as, 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 as we're understanding it as we're kind of reading and consuming suggests that there were medium to long run effects on health. So there's a study uh, on, uh, uh, from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, that, that seems to find some of these effects. There's a paper by Doug Almond uh, from, uh, I think, 2006 that shows effects on um, people who were in utero during the flu that end up having negative long-term outcomes in terms of their human capital attainment, in terms of their, uh, their income and so forth. So there are some of these negative long-run effects on human capital um, that you know, might also help understand the persistence and why, you know, one shouldn't necessarily just expect kind of a quick uh, V-shaped recovery after all, all of this is over. Some of this might be directly through health. On the second point about doctors, um, one thing that we have done already is there is this nice data from Swanson and Quran who digitized city level public spending. Um, and that includes both total public spending um, and also uh, public spending on health related expenditure. And we've tried to you know, look at that. We've tried to control for public health spending relative to, to population. It didn't change you know, our, our results uh, that much, but we, um, you know, we, we should do more there. So this is, this is something that we've only done in the past few days. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. There's uh, another question uh, from the audience before we go to Martin. Uh, Ella Niedler, um, can you hear us? Ella? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, great, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for this. Yeah, so I was wondering if you think there might be a point where the intensity could actually have a negative effect. So if say, um, as of like just given current events, um, a lot of people are out of work, manufacturing debt is zero, is that gonna end up causing kind of that vicious cycle of encouraging a stronger depression that might have more negative long-term effects? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's very clear that there is an optimal point uh, at which you want to turn off these non-pharmaceutical interventions. And we've 
kind of discussed it among the co-authors, how we could do this, how we could think about this in, in our context. I'm not entirely sure we're gonna be able to say something about that uh, just yet, but um, if you want my view on this, it's pretty clear that that if you if you were to leave those measures in place for too long, you would actually do more harm than you'd do good. That being said, as I think that the way I at least uh, think about it um, um, theoretically is, is that you wanna make sure that you actually uh, have fought the pandemic successfully. So, uh, and you wanna coordinate across different areas to, to avoid um, um, infection or spread again and again. Um, so, but yeah, our paper doesn't really, at this point have a very clear um, take on this. I think though we would all agree that there is an optimal point. So it's, you should not put uh, NPI in, in intensity to infinity. Yeah, one small point on that. Uh, hi, Sergio Correa from Fed. Um, a few cities decided to stop the, the MPIs too early when the curve was already going down, but it was not. It was still very high, and those cities essentially just had the repeat of the huge peak. So they had all the worst parts of the pandemic with not really much of the gains. So I think stopping too soon is a, a risk, probably also today. And the one other dimension is the, the calibration of the different types of policy. So Andra earlier, Andra Ghent was, was getting at, you know, how these measures were less strict than what we have today. Um, and, you know, we might be able to do a little bit on that. We do have information on, on the types of interventions that were, uh, that were put in place. Um, and also just sort of anecdotally looking at what different countries have done, it seems like there might be some types of NPIs that are less economically costly, but give you more sort of health, health kind of bang for, for your buck. So that's, that's another dimension of optimality in addition to just the, the, time, uh, the, the time dimension. Um, but so far we don't have much to say, but it's, it's a very important point. So just quick uh, follow up questions on Ella's question, because there were tons of questions also in the Q&A about nonlinearity and whether you try to put that into the estimation. So do you have an answer for, the, for that? Well, you cannot extrapolate into, into regions where we don't have data. So we cannot extrapolate to what happens if no one leaves their house or places where like MPIs that were not at all implemented there. We are cautious about what will happen. So that's, that's a big disclaimer in any linear model. Uh, there. It's not completely clear to us how to deal with it, but if, if people have, have suggestions, you know, what we do see is that in normal flu years, the flu doesn't have much of, of an impact, right, on, on the economy, at least in terms of just the correlation. And, and so you need, you know, the, this, this kind of major flu and major interventions are going to have, have these impacts. So it's highly nonlinear, but, but how we sort of speak to this in a more intelligent way, um, we're, we're very open to questions. Okay. So, uh, Martin, you had a question or suggestion as well? Yeah, um, um, uh, one question and then one maybe more suggestion. Yeah, so one uh, one issue I noticed is that the NPI speed is very fast, at least compared to the, what we see today, I think. Uh, so I'm wondering whether there's also learning from the first, uh, first wave of the epidemic. Um, so that's one issue. The other one uh, is maybe more a suggestion or just an idea about um, um, one. I guess one could. You, you mentioned that um, that the primate uh, men were sensitive to the flu. So I'm wondering about the feasibility of maybe using a shift share identification. <clears throat> yeah. So on the first point, on the speed, just to be clear, the way it's measured is the number of days after the death rate exceeds two times the baseline level. So I'm not sure if it's, okay. if it's, yeah, so if maybe it's that's faster or slower than, than today, we would have to, we'd have to do that comparison. Um, but I, I, I'm still wondering what, if there wasn't any learning from the first wave though. No? I think that's a very fair point. And I think right. we, we should, um, to be fully right. honest, we haven't really thought about that very deeply. And I, I think there, my, my, my reading is that there weren't a lot of those measures in place. My reading is that the first wave was not very lethal. Um, so my prior would be that could have just, you know, people were essentially ignorant of the problem in, in fall 1918, but that's something we need to confirm. I think is an, is an, is a, is an right. excellent point. Right. So most of the shift was, shift. sorry, go ahead. Amy. Yeah, on the shift share point, um, that's a great suggestion, suggestion actually. The death rate 
essentially is W shaped uh, in age. So it's very high for very young uh, uh, individuals, individuals younger than, than you know, five, six years old. And then individuals between age 18 and about 35. And then again, for older individuals. And so, yeah, we, you know, we're actually collecting that mortality data by very detailed age bins. Uh, and also trying to get data on the age structure across different places. And, and that, that's an excellent suggestion to maybe try to use some of that uh, in a shift share approach. And Morten, where you see most of the learning is actually in Western cities that learn from the Eastern cities. They, if you read the newspapers, they're already discussing what are they planning to do when, they, when the pandemic reaches. So even before it reaches, they already have something in place. Oh. Okay, great. So there's another question from uh, from the floor. Um, Chao Sang. Chao, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. It was a fantastic presentation paper. I may have a, a bit of like a question about um, some detail. So you in your um, results, uh, it seems to me it's uh, the direct impact is the impact that's not via the mortality rate. But then this could have a lot of channel. It could from um, like mobility, it could also from direct impact on supply side or impact from demand side. Um, are you able to say something about like which channel is giving us the, the result and do those channel have different signs in terms of the impact? I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. I think and it, the channels are, are super important to, to understand. Um, our data, as you may have seen, is not super granular. So um, there are some natural limits to, to it. But let me tell you, so first, we there, there is this aspect of it that when we measure mortality, we really just want to measure the severity of the flu because we think it's the least noisy measure of how active the flu was in a given region. Um, and we believe that actually the economic effect of the mortality measure, uh, measuring the severity of the flu is really not just capturing the fact that people are, 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 are dying from the disease, but really also that those people that are, that are, are not dying, that actually end up, uh, end up surviving the, the pandemic, actually react to the chance of contracting the virus. So I think, I think that, that's very important to keep in mind when you think about sort of the very basic channels. And when, if you want to disentangle supply and demand in this context, um, it, I think it's fairly complicated in general, and it's especially complicated in, 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 this, in this context because the data are just not uh, uh, um, extremely rich. Um, so we do have this, and I, I kind of tried to allude to that a little bit. We try to distinguish between manufacturing and vehicle registrations to kind of get a sense of manufacturing probably being rather supply driven as it's a tradable good and demand is not local. And, and car registrations rather being a indicator of local consumption and, and demand. Um, so we're getting some sense of disentangling the two, but I wouldn't push that too hard. Um, and I would at this point much rather refer to the, the theories that, that are telling us that this is both supply and demand uh, than, than looking at our paper. And I think one additional point on that, which, which relates to the discussion about the, you know, the economic impact of, of COVID-19 is, it isn't necessarily just about mortality. Again, it's also about, you know, just the risk of mortality is sort of a, a proxy for the general severity and the risk of contracting the virus. Um, and so even if you don't necessarily have very high mortality rates, if people are very responsive to the risk that they're gonna get sick, or maybe the risk that they're uh, going to uh, contract the virus and, and give it to people in their family, then that can still have economic effects, both through supply and, and demand. Okay, great. Um, so we have another question from the floor. Uh, Ming Chang, Ming Chang, can you hear us? Hey, Ning, can you hear us? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I have one question. So even though the NPIs, uh, the implementation is uh, is imposed by the local government, but the people's compliance rate may be quite different across different regions. So, I mean, the compliance rate may be still endogenous. So can you, uh, uh, can you address that a little bit? Silence. I think it's a, I, I think we should, I think it's a, yeah, it's silence. Yeah, because we, we uh, I don't think we have 
invest, spend a lot of resources on trying to get compliance data. I think it's a, it's a fantastic point we should think about and uh, get a sense and read a little bit more um, what, whether there is uh, heterogeneity across different locations and compliance. I think that'd be very important if there is, uh, that they would in fact, if at all, um, make our results uh, more precise if we had those data. So I think my, my quick answer is, it's a great point and we haven't really, uh, uh, we don't really have the data to say anything about it at this point. So for, for some of the NPIs, uh, the compliance is clear, like this, the, the closure of schools would be the closure of public schools. And then the question is whether private schools uh, would follow. And our reading of newspapers is that often they did. Um, the NPIs in the form of public gathering bans, there's essentially, you know, probably uh, close to full compliance there. But then on the other dimensions, like, you know, hy hygiene um, and mask wearing and, and those sorts of uh, uh, NPIs, we don't have data right now. Um, and if anyone has any suggestions on where to possibly find that type of data, we'd be you know, very interested in it, yeah. But it's an important point. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so let's see. There was also one question in the Q&A just quickly to ask you because there was a question about other government measures because nowadays we see also a lot of fiscal support for businesses and so on for households. Were there similar measures in place back then and do you have good measures of those? So my understanding, yeah. I mean, our understanding is, you know, first of all, this is before the Great Depression. It's before macroeconomics, it's before Keynes. So um, I don't, you know, our understanding is that there's very limited uh, uh, sort of, you know, fiscal policy response to, to any yeah. of this, the role of the government in the economy is also much, much smaller. Um, so that's that's another important difference in terms of external validity uh, to, I think, to today. Yeah, I think the Federal Reserve has a very different role back then. Also the federal government under Woodrow Wilson is only becoming uh, much stronger than, so it's very different than today at the federal level. Um, at the local level, I think that's uh, that's something we're trying to get a sense of, of, of local pub by using data on local public spending that we're gathering right now. Um, I, we have not, I don't think that the fiscal capacity of the local authorities was high enough to do uh, very significant um, 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 demand stimulus, but it's something we should also, I think, yeah, look into to the extent that it was possible at the local level that whether it affected the outcomes. It's also the open question that if the firms back then, especially smaller firms, were not as leveraged, um, owned their own uh, like buildings, so they didn't have to pay rent, the cost might have been lower. So potentially you won't see a coffee shop bankrupt in three months or one month just because it has no customers. That's that's still an open question that will be answered with today's data. Okay, no, great guys. So I, I think it's basically time time to wrap up. So I think we had a super nice presentation, uh, lots of questions. So that was great. Thank you so much. Um, the next VMAX is going to be on, on Thursday by... Um, I can bomb Rebello Trabant on the macroeconomics of epidemics. So thank you very much for joining today and, um, and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thanks so much. Take care.